Daniel Andrisek, you're here, right? I just saw you. Yeah, is it okay if I tease you a little bit in a minute? Cool. Ah. Uh-oh. Did I close all those browser windows? Hooray! That looks okay. So, uh, I'm very, very flattered to be invited to speak here today. This is an event I've been to a couple times already and uh, in a city that I really enjoy visiting. So, thanks again for that. This was also an interesting challenge because um, the team contacted me and said, hey, we'd like you to come and speak. And I said, I'd be very happy to. And they said, here's your topic. <laughs> um, so that was kind of fun. And um, we'll see how this goes. This is my uh, hipster camouflage suit, <laughs> right? And uh, yeah, so that was funny. In, who was in DrupalCon? Portland. So Robert Douglas and I went on stage at the beginning of the conference and uh, started doing our thing in our funny suits and the people from Four Kitchens were madly tweeting, come to our booth, come to our booth, come to our booth. And I didn't know why until I discovered that uh, they had brought this photo wall with them. So I really, it's, um, I think it's the best photo on the internet, but, uh, <laughs> but that's just me. So, uh, I talk with a lot of different audiences and I just want to make sure um, that we're roughly on the same turf. Who here um, is, is um, I don't want to say a Drupal professional, but I mean who works with Drupal? Who, who, who does Drupal stuff for clients? Okay, and who does Drupal stuff, and when I say do Drupal stuff, you know, theming, writing, whatever it is, who does Drupal stuff inside an organization, more or less for that organization or for your own business or something like that? Who is here because they've heard of this Drupal thing and they wanna check it out this weekend? Nice, <laughs> that's cool. And, uh, oh, okay, yeah, here's the best question. Who's at their first Drupal community event today? All right, everybody who's been here before, welcome. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for coming, it's great. Uh, we really believe in sharing and we really love seeing new people coming uh, to, our, to our community. So, so thanks for coming and um, um, I'm gonna air a little bit of community dirty laundry in a little while, but don't worry, it's all, it's all cool, it's all, it's all nice. We're all friends here. So, <laughs> I, my, my talk is roughly in three sections. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Drupal's history as a connector. So this idea of connecting open minds, how, you know, since the open sourcing of the code, what's happened, just some highlights from then until now. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, why we're succeeding. I work in the marketing department of a company and we talk a lot about this thing that we're calling digital experiences. And if you are, you know, blessed or cursed to be in the world where you're, you're dealing with very large companies and very large sums of money, um, people like Forrester and Gartner and the analyst companies um, um, are, are trying to capture mind space with this, with this idea of web experience management or digital experience or customer journey or all this stuff. But um, I just want to talk about why Drupal as a platform is succeeding by fulfilling the needs of, of, of clients today and why it's, you know, how it's got, Drupal supports more than just making websites now. So I just want to show some real projects and some thing that's, things that Drupal's doing and just talk a little bit about the definition of this digital experience thing that we work with just because I think it's a, a one part of why Drupal's succeeding. And then in the third section, I want to talk just a little bit about some of the challenges and questions that I see our community facing right now and how we might um, go forward. Uh, so, um, and the last section is really uh, questions and challenges. So I'd like to, I'd like it to start some discussions. I'd like you to go out of this thinking about uh, where we are now and where we could be and, and how we're going to get there. So it's a, it's a different kind of an ending today. Let's do some of the fun part. <clears throat> so in 
since. So, um, in the year 2001, uh, the world was very different. And um, Dries always shows that slide. Everybody who's been to a Drupal thing before knows what I'm talking about, right? Him in his student dorm and he says, here's my C compiler books and here's my chess set and, and look at what a geek I was. I decided not to show that, but you know what? At the same time, okay, that, that Drupal was being created, a guy called Jim Alchin of Microsoft said this, and this is astonishing um, to look at this now. I can't imagine something that would be worse than this for the software business. Everybody put their hands up again who's making a living with open source software. So my primary test of whether Drupal is succeeding is whether my rent is being paid. Um, and we could talk later about intrinsic and extrinsic and altruistic and pragmatic motivation. But honestly, if my rent's not being paid, nothing else is gonna happen. So, you know, we're doing okay <laughs> on that score. Um, a um, guy called Jim Zemlin then said a couple of years ago this. I don't make it a practice of, you know, kicking Microsoft or anyone else around the block, but it's, it's certainly funny. So, you know, 2001, by the way, this is the watershed moment when Dries, he had been given an, a DSL modem to test in... Antwerp. It was one of the first systems and they passed them out and he was, you know, studying computer science and so he got one of these modems and he had this incredible internet signal and he wanted to share that with his friends. So they figured out how to share it. Okay, this is the connecting open lines part. Subtext. And uh, then they made this bulletin board so they could say, you know, let's go for pizza tonight and let's do all that stuff. And it went pretty well and that got open sourced in 2001 and that was that was Drupal, and that was drop.org at the time. So this is the context of, of how radical a move that was, right, in 2001. It was, it was a very new thing. So why open source? I like, um, I like, the, I think I'm missing a slide, excuse me. Hmm, okay, in any case, I've lost my pointer. Ha ha ha. So, like I said, this is a new presentation. Um, so this is a, uh, who, knows, who knows Larry Lessig or who that is, right? Creative, he's the guy who invented Creative Commons. And he's moved on from thinking about copyright to thinking about corruption, um, at how money itself corrupts political processes. And he, he wrote an interesting book about American politics. Um, and he said, you know what? Open source is a way to provide the fastest possible rate of improvement for ideas. And, and I love that idea. So... I just wanted to throw that in there, like how great open source is and why people would be using it. Uh, fast forward to 2004. Who knows who that is? Ha ha ha, this is good. Uh, so in the United States, a lot more geeks would recognize Howard Dean. Howard Dean ran for president in 2004 and the activists around his campaign, he was the internet candidate. Um, and he was supposed to, you know, motivate the Generation X and all that stuff. And his teams created a Drupal distribution called Dean Space. And it was the first Drupal distribution, probably. Um, I suppose I would have to look up exactly when CVCRM and all of that was getting started, but it was one of the first. And basically, it gave you a kit, you could install this thing on a server and make your local group um, Howard Dean campaign site and organize your events and organize your fundraising with this, with this thing. So it was really bringing people together to get behind uh, political activism. In terms of Drupal's history, it's also significant because the people who made Dean Space um, uh, among them were the people who went on to make Chapter 3 and Music for America and Pantheon and a whole bunch of uh, interesting things. So we're talking about Josh Koenig, uh, Zach Rosen, Matt Cheney. Those people were involved in Dean Space. Um, so that was cool. Uh, Drupal really came to prominence in that period. People started checking it out. Um, Drupal has a lot of traction in, in the media industries now. And um, sometime around 2005, Lullabot rebuilt the site f 
for mtv.co.uk. And um, so I wrote Connecting the Cool Kids here. Uh, on a technical level, it was an amazing thing because uh, Jeff Robbins wrote a module called the Login Toboggan. Does anybody know that? Right, so single sign-on, they, they, they integrated dozens of external um, services and, and platforms into this site. You know, there was, a, there was already a thing where you could make your own user avatar and that was a separate service that they, you know, that MTV bought and integrated. And so, so this was a huge um, leap in prominence for the, for the platform, but also a huge technical leap. The, the things that Lullaba did for the Drupal platform through this project were, were pretty amazing. And, you know, obviously we're still using them. Fast forward, so, so businesses, businesses figuring out that Drupal's kind of interesting. Um, who remembers Rain City Studios or Bright? Mm, old, the, the old school kids are down, are down here. Um, so Rain City Studios was a really early uh, sort of Drupal agency and they did a lot of cool things. Bright made a platform that was way ahead of its time um, and so it was hosted Drupal and you get a hosted Drupal site and they take care of the details and um, I say it was ahead of its time because unfortunately it didn't uh, work out but there are a lot of very cool people involved in these two companies including Jacob Redding who was until recently the uh, head of the Drupal Association so at this point uh, businesses started springing up around Drupal um, um, you know more and more Drupal shops but also Th things that weren't just site building were, were starting to happen. Uh, the earliest Drupal hosting companies sprang up. Um, and, um, right. So, oh, here's, this is nice. This is a press release, actually. This is a press release from 2007. I think we have time for this. Rain City Studios, a web design and development firm, has purchased Bright, a company that develops and hosts Drupal-based CMS sites for an undisclosed sum. Um, da, da, da. Oh, plans, for, plans call for Rain City to still develop high-end sites, but they want to also develop turnkey-style community sites that are tailored to different niches. This is where Bright and their Drupal background comes in to plan the... Oh, that's funny. It's not even written right here. The larger scheme of the new arrangement. And uh, in addition to the two companies merging, they will also be opening a new office in Shanghai, China, to address the growing market that's opening up there. And I think it was a fantastic idea. It didn't work out so great, but, you know, business was starting to happen. More and more people were moving into the Drupal space. And then in 2007, somebody, somebody got a really cool job. In 2007, somebody got a phone call and uh, was told, listen, just lock yourself in your room and get Drupal 6 out the door, please. We've got a paycheck for you for that. And uh, that guy's right here, actually, Gabor Hoichi. He was the first employee of what became Acquia. And Acquia not only, you know, helped get Drupal 6 out the door, which was great, um, and paid Gabor's rent, which I think was also great, um, so the, the connecting the dots here, what a classic IT buyer used to the you know computer industry since the 60s or the 70s, when they're looking for software to invest in for a company, um, they're looking for a certain number of elements, and the Drupal, uh, Drupal as a platform didn't have commercial SLA-based support. They didn't have organizations who you could call at three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday whenever and say my site is down you have to fix it so uh, Dries and Jay Batson founded a company to offer commercial support for Drupal so that completed this ecosystem and it allowed among many other things it allowed for uh, the White House website to be put on Drupal it allowed a lot of corporate clients high-end enterprise stuff to happen with Drupal, so you know the more so basically, um, I would contend that Acquia's offering of commercial support allowed the market to grow for one upwards, and um, it gave a lot of legitimacy to Drupal as a platform. So all of us as Drupal service providers uh, of any kind, we can say, look who's you know, look at the kind of people using Drupal. This is a safe bet for your school, for your club, for your 20-person company, for your 100-person company, for your charity, whatever it is. Um, 
Plus, we're pretty blessed in Drupal that the companies who work with Drupal are pretty damn good about giving back the code improvements, the technology improvements that they make. So we are really all sharing uh, the same. We're on a we're on a, a level playing field, technologically speaking. So so I really like that. Um, and uh, I think it's really great that at that point, companies like Al Jazeera, companies like Warner Brothers, um, you know, The Economist, people all were getting into Drupal. I should mention Sony here. Sony's been in Drupal much, much, much longer than this. Sony actually paid Earl Miles for a long time to have him on staff to basically work on views, which is an awesome contribution. So I think they were way ahead of the curve along the way. Um, so, you know, the White House had this website and then this amazing thing happened during DrupalCon Munich. During DrupalCon Munich, the White House opened its first GitHub repository. It now has, does anybody know for sure, it's like seven or 12? Uh, the White House is really getting into open source. There have been hackathons there. It's kind of amazing. So they made this application called We the People, and it was a way, it's a way to, um, you know, to communicate with, with your constituents. Um, it's, a, it's a petition application that has to do with the constitutional right in the United States of people to petition their government to make changes. Um, and they promised to address things. Um, fa very famous example, somebody uh, petitioned the White House to build a United States Death Star. Um, and there's a great response online. Uh, the White House answered, answered that and, and said they weren't going to. Um, but it's fantastic. It's really, it's a one. It's really funny. It you know adds a real human face to this. But um, I'm going to talk about this just a little bit later. But the idea that you can build government infrastructure um, with open source software is is, is really important. And um, in my slides about why it matters that we're doing open source, I'm going to try and remember to come back to this one point because uh, because it's it's uh, I I think it's really important. So. We're, now we're roughly here today, and as Josef was talking about, I think we're connecting communities now. I was just at Symphony Live in Berlin, and that was really interesting, and I'm going to SymphonyCon in Warsaw in a, in a couple of weeks. I'm really, really looking forward to that. In the last year, year and a half, I've been to some PHP events, and I really, really love seeing um, these different communities, and honestly, they're, they're sometimes astonishingly different to ours. I come right, Drupal was my first software project. My, you know, it's the only thing I knew until, until fairly recently. And, and it's amazing to see how they do things and to talk with them and, and see how they perceive us and where they perceive us as being behind and where they perceive us as being ahead. It's pretty fascinating. So um, I think that we should really, really embrace this chance to get new perspectives. I am... Um, it turns out that Sensio Labs in Germany is two blocks from my house in Cologne. And uh, they've promised to tell me when the user group events are in Germany. And I have promised them to invite all of Drupal to come and go to those user groups. And um, yeah, so, so, so I'd love to see some real actual interchange with these people. I think there's a lot that everybody can learn from each other. So that is a little bit about this the history of Drupal from the perspective of what we're, what we're connecting, okay? So why is it that Drupal is succeeding right now? What is it that we're doing? Um, I want to talk about business now, and this is not the only reason you could or should be in Drupal, and there are lots and lots of other very valid models of action. And, and, and reasons to be in open source software. I just want to talk about this basically because it comes back to um, all of us also having to pay the rent. And uh, not at all by accident, it is a world, it is a world that, I have, um, that I have a lot to do with now uh, b because I work in a, the largest kind of a company. So um, Drupal's succeeding because it's, so Drupal, right, open source in fact okay, is succeeding because it actually provides a lot of what businesses need. I've, I'm, I'm working on some materials that are a lot more extensive than this, but if you come down to it, really, 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 when, what you need as a business is you need to be profitable, right? Um, you need to make sure that all those people who've put their trust in you, everyone who works for you, 
that you can pay them next month. So you, you do need to bring in more money than you spend on stuff. And I contend that open source allows us to be profitable because it offers opportunities for innovation, cost savings, efficiency, productivity, and risk mitigation. So I say, right, open source delivers these things. Um, I was just talking with some, some actual business audiences yesterday in Munich about this, and I think all of us should be familiar with what open source is. The, the, this is a, the four freedoms which are derived from Richard Stallman's original three freedoms that define free software. Um, but it, the, 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 the open source definition that I like to use to explain people is you're free to use it for anything, you're free to understand what you're getting, you're free to change it, and you're free to do whatever you want with those changes. In the best case, in our case, we pretty much give those back so that, you know, my fix bugs are your fix bugs, that all that, you know, sharing happens, that all that connecting happens. So anyway, so I contend that open source delivery these things. I have a few quick examples of, of uh, that I think show this. Um, Jeff Eaton turned me onto a book called Democratizing Innovation, which, which was written largely before the open source revolution was actually happening. And it's really, really fascinating. And he says, you know, if you're using something every day, you actually know best what you need to get your job done, right? So, so, this, so with open source, I can build exactly the tool that I need to do exactly what I want to do. And no matter if that is a job that everybody does, but I want to execute better, or if it's a completely radical new idea, I can innovate with open source because I'm not locked into somebody else's idea of what the 80-20 feature set should be. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is why that other slide was in the wrong place. It's because I meant to put it here. Um, we already had that. I'll move it out later. Um, if you want to be innovative, you know, the, the Drupal community loves these examples. Uh, you know, do you remember when at font face came out? When Google let us actually put different fonts on the web for the first time? The Drupal module was, was released the next day, right? When Pinterest was really new, it hit 10 million uniques for the first time. Somebody wanted a module. Two months later, there was already 15 Drupal sites online with um, full Pinterest integration. Uh, so if you're pitching, open source, if you're pitching Drupal to somebody, um, business people love examples like this. They love hearing about things that they've heard of that, you know, somehow relate to what we are doing and that it, you know, can help them. Point two, cost efficiency, okay, open source is not free. It does have a zero price tag, right, but you're, you're, you're you know, look, this is an IT project, right? Everybody, no matter what you're using, everybody's got a lot of costs. Um, but the fundamental difference is when you come down to saying, oh, that download, right, that you get, that you don't have to pay for, maybe pay for over and over again, that allows you to invest your money in your team, right? Or invest it in your vision in some way, or only buy exactly that one thing that you need and save the rest for later, okay? It really allows you to be a lot smarter with your money. Um, the freedoms also allow us to choose our service providers, to own our own data, all this nice stuff. Um, but um, another way to pitch this in a business meeting, I, I beg you if, you, if you sell projects to clients, um, selling cheaper and cheaper and then undercutting and then cheaper is a race to the bottom and it's not gonna help all of us. Um, business people love to hear, hear this. So if you've got a hundred money for your project, right? Um, implementation is probably gonna cost about the same. Hosting and support might cost the same. When you get to this license fee, which is radically different, it actually lets you, right? Invest in the stuff that you need the most, okay? It allows you to, to build a better project by definition, it allows you to build a better project for the same amount of money that they would have invested using proprietary software. So, so this is a this is a this is a, a nice this is a nice example. 
economies of plenty are an interesting thing, and because we live in a world with you know coins in our pockets and uh, physical things that run out, if I drink a coffee, then the coffee is 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 gone, right? Um, we live in an economy of scarcity, and owning things and controlling their distribution is a way of extracting value from them. An economy of plenty is where resources don't run out. So open source, the more people who use your software, the more valuable it is. The more people who download it, right, the better the chances are they're going to find a security hole, they're going to find a bug, they're going to, uh, in our case, then fix it and give those things back and somebody's gonna refactor it for you. And over time, the more people who use a piece of open source software, the more valuable it becomes. And um, so, and in the real world, uh, uh, I met Stefan Lückel, who's the head of the, the German Drupal Association recently, and he got a, um, a project for a German city government in the state I live in, in Nordrhein-Westfalen, and they asked him to build a digit, digital assets management solution for their city. And in the RFP, they, they, so, and this is a great sign for us as Drupal service providers, the clients are actually getting smart to this stuff. They said, the solution that you build must be open source because not only do we want to pass this on to other cities to let them save money, but we understand that if this is put into a community with a critical mass of users, and this is a problem that other people need to solve, it will get better over time, and our initial investment will be multiplied many, many times over. You know, very, in a very stupid way, you could say, you know, you buy it once and the upgrades are for free. I don't, uh, but um, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic idea. Um, and so, this is cost efficiency then, in terms of productivity, here we are as a Drupal community, plus minus right now, and if you tell a business person, listen, you've downloaded Drupal Core at a price of zero, you're getting millions of hours of coding and millions of hours of best practices and, and refactorings and efficiencies from a, a community of, of thousands of the smartest people there are, then you get to add on to that for Drupal 7, 7,000, 7,500 modules, which are in themselves mini software projects, crystallized best practices. If you're using popular, well-adopted modules, you get thousands of hours more of investment in your business done from your perspective completely altruistically. You turn this stuff on, right? Your project is already millions of hours underway when, you ha when you're in minute zero of your planning. So that's, that's an incredible productivity boost, incredible e efficiency boost compared to other ways of solving things. Uh, risk mit mitigation in the United States, in the restaurant business, they say you gotta own the bricks. And that means if you rent a place and you start a restaurant and you're successful because you're such a great cook um, or you mix such great cocktails, that the landlord could come back the year after and could say, you are doing a great job at that. I think you need to pay me more rent, right? <laughs> you've built up a location, you've built up a following, and then you're screwed. So um, when we download an application from a proprietary vendor and we pay for it, and it is not making them enough profit, they are going to turn it off. I don't want my government, I don't want my personal business built on things that I'm not in control of, right? I don't want something that could be sunsetted, I don't want to be offered the option to upgrade to the thing that's twice as expensive next year. There's a Drupal 3 site that's still online. I should get a screenshot that I forgot to. There's a Drupal 3 site that's still online. It looks really, really funky, but it does exactly what the guy needs. Why should he change? I'm sure it's secure, right? There's... <laughs> <laughs> so, open source lets us uh, do a lot of risk mitigation, which is really important in business, um, in ma many more ways than this, but fundamentally you have the control of what you're using to implement your vision. I think it's a, a very, very important uh, reason. So, I, have, I, could, I could do this 
for days this talk with a lot more examples, but I think I could show quickly that in open source delivers all these things, therefore open source allows profitability, all right? So I think it's a good idea for business to be using open source software. Why are we succeeding? Not only are we open source, but we're delivering digital experiences. So now you get a, a vision into the world of marketing and buzzwords, um, you know, and the meetings that I have every week. Sorry, I'm not, this microphone is a little weird here. Um, so, digital experiences. Let's get to what an experience is when we are talking to people that we're trying to sell our work to. Uh, fundamentally, it comes down, oh yeah, I stole this slide from Dries, and then I added one word myself, so <clears throat> that's a value add. Uh, so a digital experience, right, is offering the right content at the right place, at the right time. Um, you know, so th those three things are, are, are a context, and a context makes an experience. An experience delivers what our customers all want, which is engagement. That you, you, you want members for your club, you want to sell widgets, you want to attract students to your university, whatever it is, you want to engage them. And now, I love that I'm giving this talk in English today because presenting this slide in German, right? German speakers, ex digital experience and engagement, right? <laughs> completely untranslatable. So I, so I always start in on this one like, so there are these really bullshit English words that we use and you know, I'm gonna say it and then we can talk about what that actually means. <laughs> so, so to get engagement, right? To get people to interact with us, to, to, to get us, to get to them excited about what we do or, or you know, at least buying it, right? Um, these digital experiences, these contexts can be made up of a lot of things and, the, and it's, it can be more than this. But, you know, I'm going to show some, some, cool Drupal, Jesus, some cool Drupal sites now that have some of these different elements of, you know, personalization. Where am I? What device am I using? Um, uh, conversation, search experiences. Um, search experience for me is something where search is more than just I put in a word and I get a list, right? Um, and this agi business agility and value. So digital asset management, the ability to build lots of small sites quickly is really, really valuable to a lot of people now. Um, integrations, customizations, um, and so on. So these are different elements of the digital experience right now. If you're making the, the, the business case to, to somebody who wants to buy this thing, um, nobody can sell you a digital, a, a single unified digital experience package. And this is our advantage as Drupal service providers now. So here's your pitch. Um, our, our proprietary competition will offer some organizations to, they will install the digital experience solution and it will work, you know, it will do everything. But, so, which is good because there are no new technologies coming, you know, next week on the internet and things aren't changing all the time in our world, right? So you can totally, build that one thing, like with MySpace and um, um, what was that thing called? Ge GeoCities, right? Integration, and you're set, and you're set for a decade with that. You need a modular, open source, standards-based solution that is future-friendly to allow you to offer exactly what somebody needs now keep what's working for them now and allow them to swap out parts or add parts to it later to have their ideal solution. So I want to point out that all these digital experiences that I'm going to show, they're not even remotely similar to each other in most cases, okay? And this is an advantage for us. This is a, this is a real modularity open source story. So, Symantec, um, I found out an astonishing statistic. Every support ticket that gets through uh, the knowledge base and support deflection and whatever at Symantec costs about $60 to process between human time and resources and everything else. So they built a Drupal Commons website and it's got all the cool stuff like gamification and, and badges and you see this guy here on the bottom with uh, 
Um, you know, he's got an um, employee badge and an accredited badge, and he's got some points and stuff. But fundamentally, they built a, a support community where you can register and interact with other Symantec users and help each other out. Oh my God, who would do that? <laughs> uh, we do it all the time, right? We love sharing and uh, how we fix stuff. This is the whole reason why Drupal succeeded, okay? So they took this and they made a community with some intrinsic motivation factors in it. Uh, there's one user in there. Um, I mean, most of this, of course, is the long tail effect. There's one user in there who's answered more than a thousand support tickets, okay? Which is pretty awesome. Um, that saved Symantec 60,000 bucks. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, both the Brit Awards and the Grammys are on Drupal. Um, this is also about scalability because these sites, I think the Grammys got 460 million page views on one weekend when, when the Grammy show came on and you know, 72 hours of live streaming and blah, blah, blah going on. But basically, um, these, these digital experiences are fantastic. So in the, in the case of the Brit Awards, uh, they've got TV ads sending people to see exclusive content on the website. The website is promoting the TV show, right? Then they've got social integration. They're, 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 they're taking tweets and stuff. Um, they're actually working with the radio as well. So it's this virtuous circle of all these things pushing together for one week uh, to, to come to that one weekend a year where there's the awards show. Uh, th their point of, in the end, their business model, they're selling advertising, right? But they can put together these incredible multimedia things with very small staffs, handle this incredible social interaction between all the users watching this stuff, um, bounce it back and forth between different media and, and really build up some fantastic success. Um, this is also a digital experience. So here's a wonderful couple of examples of where things are starting to go. And some of this is, some of this sounds a little bit obvious, but, but I think this is actually, I think what Timex is doing is pointing in a couple of new directions, which, which I really, really like. So you know what? We make watches, we sell watches. That's what an e-commerce website site is for, right? You put your catalog online and then you're done. So that's what Timex did until last year. And you see, look, look at that lovely search there. I want a, um, I want a dive style watch in red and, you know, with a black band. And then I can see it. Um, now, Timex is offering this vision of um, this is your life. So they've got, for this, uh, for the fashionista, um, audience, they've got content, they've got um, bloggers, they've got people talking and they'll, they'll do theme articles, they'll get placements in other media, Timex watches in the middle of magazines or whatever, it's all pushing back to here, all sorts of content supports that. If that's not your thing, they've got a real um, entire huge runners community. Um, they've got, uh, I've got a couple of slides of it in a second, but they've got, um, they've got they sponsor athletic teams, they have training videos, they have tips, they have the equipment to support all this and they're happy to sell that to you. But they're actually producing a wealth of really, really valuable content for real athletes and then linking their brand to that. And I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a lot less, you know, obnoxious or it's a, it's a lot more interesting certainly than just saying, we make watches, we sell watches, right? Um, here is uh, an example of how search doesn't have to be boring. The examples are nicely presented. And this is, of course, solar search facet. Those are the search facets. But instead of putting in words, they put in colors. They put in actual pictures. It's great. Um, that's a great way to implement that if you have anything that can be done that way. This is a little bit more of the running content. Um, they've got runners blogs here. Um, they've got training tips. They've got uh, all the videos in there. And then they have this Facebook app where if you tweet, I am a, a runner with that hashtag, then it gets in this wall here. And um, I was watching it right at the end of the New York Marathon and it was fantastic. It was, and it was, really, it was really compelling. I mean, for the same reason that we love Twitter and Instagram, you know, it, this is like, you know, this is a really, this is a fantastic Twitter world if, if you're into that stuff. It's amazing. So I think Timex is offering a, a real, a really interesting vision of, of you know, content driven experiences. All of this works on phones, all of this works on tablets, um, and it's all integrated into their larger campaigns. So 
Timex is do, doing pretty well with Drupal, right? If you need to talk to people about a, a luxury brand, about customization, about making Drupal look um, exactly like you want it, Jimmy Page, um, not only does he have his, you know, his metal aesthetic or whatever it is nowadays, but um, he's doing a really interesting couple of things here. He's got a very small site, but it's, um, it's a community. You can sign in, you have profiles, right? And he sells physical objects. He sells downloads. He um, also does this feed where, it's, where he's got things that, you know, significant events in the past. There's a SoundCloud integration. If you go to the SoundCloud, um, then you can see more of his stuff, and of course, you, then you can go and buy more of his stuff. Um, you know, but if you're, in, if you're into Jimmy Page, this is awesome. And then it all kind of comes together because you could do things like search for any concert he ever played with sorted by band, sorted by location, sorted by time, and then maybe see some, you know, hopefully in the best case, some more information about the concert see who else on the site was at that gig and then talk with them about your experience together. It's, it's, it's a really powerful social thing and it's, it's this incredible, you know, it's very small, it's a very, very, very niche uh, interest group, but it's, it's kind of a, a, a great vision of how you can tie all of these elements together and, and I'm sure that this kind of concept, uh, you know, can, can be uh, used all over the place. So digital experience, uh, this is, um, ITV has a very popular children's television show where they have stories and they're also told in sign language at the same time. And so here's the website and you see the great customized interface so that children could use this. And then this um, Drupal backend, you can also become, uh, you can register and you can buy different memberships and you can, um, you can buy access to more content. And this Drupal installation is also the single canonical back end for their native iOS app. So in your library of paid content, you know, whatever you have access to uh, from the site, you also get access to here. Then they have, you know, exclusive app content. But it's a, it's a fantastic way of centrally managing all this content, centrally managing users and, and doing everything in one place. And it, it looks kind of cool. I was in London in the spring and I gave a talk at an e-commerce event at a place called the Hospital Club. And it turns out that Shepherd Neem, which is the oldest brewer, I think in the UK, it has two, 450 pubs in the southeast of England. Um, they have a pub finder. This is my kind of digital experience, okay? <laughs> so, so I put in, you know, hospital club, Covent Garden, and then I could actually filter those search results. You know, do I want food? Do I want a historic building? Do I want Wi-Fi? Now, I have no friends, so obviously I want to be able to go to a pub with Wi-Fi and <laughs> get my work done, um, right? Uh, I... You shouldn't laugh. <laughs> so, so I put in, hey, hospital club, where are we going after I give my talk? And all this stuff came out, right? And then the results are kind of cool and they've got this key for um, uh, what's going on at each of the pubs, you know what they have. Now, I'm very suspicious. I would, based on this search result, I would never go to pub number seven. Who can tell me why? Right, there's no drinks there apparently. And in number three, I don't know, it's, that's crazy. I don't know what's going on there. And then on the same search results page, I also um, get this, you know, Google Maps integration right there. So, so that's a fantastic, that's a fantastic uh, a digital experience right there. If anybody thinks that digital experiences are just trivial, you know, are just to sell more things or, you know, to buy a Jimmy Page record or whatever. Um, the Florida Hospital Group, they have 22 hospitals, they have a main site, they have uh, a series of sub-sites for each of their institutions. Each doctor gets a microsite, each clinic has its own things. They have really excellent um, calendar integration. You can apply to get appointments online, you can talk with people, you can chat with um, staff directly to set things up. It's, it's, a, it's a really lovely set of, of Drupal um, sites. 
that cover a lot of these digital experience spaces, but check out that red bar at the bottom of the screen. This site is responsive as well. It has that red bar at the bottom on, the, on, a, on a tablet and on your phone. The website checks your location and it tells you where the nearest three emergency rooms are and what their current waiting times are. So I think that's, you know, all of a sudden digital experience gets this actual, you know, air of importance because this is actually life and death in, in you know, importance. I know if, if, uh, if I'm having a medical emergency right now, I'm going to go to that second hospital where the waiting time is four minutes for the emergency room, um, depending on how far away everything is. But I think that's amazing, right, to think that actually all of this web stuff that we do, we build websites, right? But it can have real consequences in the real world and it can make people's lives actually better. So I think that's, I think that's a really, really cool aspect of digital experiences. So we've got about seven minutes to go. And so I contend that, you know, as a community, we're doing really well, and um, I showed you some of the some of the things that I think are, are important and why. Um, we've gotten to this point. Are we going to grow as a uh, grow as a community more? Are there going to be more Drupal websites? Are we going to advance? How are we going to continue to pay our rent? Um, some people, I want to. Here's this is a little motivation. I think some people. Um, I was reading some interesting blog posts now where. To me, it's a sign that open source has kind of won already because uh, there's a guy saying online, well, it doesn't matter if a CMS is open source or proprietary, it's about features and service. I, pro I promise my CMS, so this is somebody who runs a proprietary CMS, I promise my CMS will do what you need. Nobody cares about the rest, right? So he's saying uh, proprietary or open source doesn't matter. Um, I think it does. I think it really, really, really matters, and I think there are very, very many reasons that it matters. But um, so here's one of my favorite reasons. Who met, uh, who, who, who knows Vincenzo Rubano? Yeah, so, so this guy's amazing. He's still, he's, in, he's an Italian high school student. He's been blind since birth. He uses Drupal to run his own website. It's called Ti Tengo Docchio. It means I've got my eye on you. And it's a website to promote accessibility on the web and in software. And on, that, on his website, he keeps a blacklist of other websites and applications that are not accessible. And he doesn't just stop at pointing fingers at people, right? He writes reports on those sites and apps to help the developers who are willing to improve their software, right? So how's that for making a, a, a positive difference to the world, right? Because we made an open source platform that's accessible enough for him to use, right? He can then go help other projects and other applications become more accessible. Um, he's, also, um, he's also been working in core, he's been working a lot with Mike Gifford in the accessibility issue queue, working on fixing all sorts of areas in Drupal. He's uh, a, a big patch tester now and um, he was the beneficiary of a very early crowd, well, shouldn't say that, uh, of, a, of a crowdfunding effort around to get him to DrupalCon Portland. Um, he couldn't afford to get there. Palantir gave him a ticket and a bunch of us threw in a bunch of money um, uh, via Indiegogo to pay for him to be there. And um, yeah, it's fantastic. So I say open source really matters. Now, who submitted a patch to Drupal? Who's reviewed a patch Who's filed a bug report? Okay. Who's, who's been on an event team for a Drupal community event? Right? And who's, who's sponsored something in Drupal? An event, a Git tip, a who's given money to make Drupal better? Right? So who, run, who, who maintains a module? Ah, right? So. If you've never done any of that, it, 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 maybe you don't have time, maybe you don't have money, maybe you, it's, it's perfectly okay. We're here for you, and um, honestly, 
to a large degree, if you're actually using the software, uh, you're contributing as well. But, um, and it's all still okay. It's all good. But there are an incredible number of ways for us to contribute, but there are some people that are having trouble contributing, and I've ended up um, almost by accident in the middle of a lot of conversations lately about um, um, where the project is going and, and how we make it more sustainable. So I just want to throw some questions out there. And, um, you know, we can't really have a discussion now, but um, this is stuff I'm really, really interested in. So, so you know, let's talk this weekend. Um, can, Drupal, can Drupal be a career? Can we find structures to, for people just to sit and work on core or just to work on contrib? or just to do something that's not a client project. There are a lot of people trying to figure out how that works. You know, um, there are people asking for money on Git tip. I think that's fine. I think it relies on being a little bit famous and I'm not sure that that's, you know, that's certainly not easy. Um, and it's certainly not working for very many people for very much money right now. Um, uh, Top Shelf Modules has a fantastic idea about making the, co the quality of the contributed space a lot better and making it so that, you know, how many of our pro site builds, um, you know, how much time do you budget for fixing all the damn modules that you've chosen and making sure that they work? So they've got these really interesting ideas about compatibility, about coding standards, about, and then guaranteeing a certain level of module quality, which should drop the, you know, r reduce the amount of work that we need to do to, to build sites Right? Therefore, making us more efficient and making everybody more profitable. So I think it's potentially very, very, very worth supporting top shelf modules. Drupal Fund, um, I'm a community advisor to Drupal Fund. Drupal Fund is uh, like Kickstarter for Drupal. I think um, it's probably just like Kickstarter is great for getting new ideas going. I think that it could be a great venue to help, um, you know, help our community survive. So, um, so I'm really, really, really wondering how we can find a sustainable path to maintain and improve quality and, and, and just, you know, there's only so much that client projects and vol volunteer time will get us. Um, as a marketer and I like data, you know, maybe we should integrate three or four things straight into Drupal.org and then see what happens. You know, so, you know support my queue, uh, do, you know, and, and just let some of these solutions uh, work for a while and see, see what the results are. I mean, because we can talk about it and, and the theoretical benefits and, and differences, but I'm not sure, you know, I think maybe we should just try it. I think maybe we should just do it and see what happens. Um, oh yeah, so, right, two more things and then, 10 seconds, two more things then I'm done, right? Where's the next big Drupal company? Okay, we're a legitimate big business ecosystem now because we have support, because we have hosting, because we have all these things that IT buyers now need. I think to get us as a community to the next level, to grow again by an order of magnitude, to, be, to, to take over another couple percent of the web, I think we need four or five or six or ten companies of three, five, six hundred people doing Drupal. And, and I would love it if the people in this room were all part of that, that kind of a success. So I really, really think that, um, that things are good now, but they could be a lot better if uh, we figure out ways to do more business together, all of us. And um, the last point is simply an observation, and I think it has been a key to our success, but I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to, to, to pull it apart yet. I'm not sure why it is. Drupal started as a collection of, of students sharing stuff in a dorm, right? And we identify ourselves as a community and we come here. Who comes, who comes here to a Drupal camp um, to share the cool thing that they figured out, you know, pretty recently and show everyone else that this amazing thing that they've done, right? And who else is here to see that amazing thing that somebody's figured out, right? Now, if I compare this to um, maybe a symphony event or a PHP Benelux uh, th th that I went to this year, uh, the PHP, the individual platform communities have less of a feeling of solidarity and their events are not, let's get together and look at cool stuff. Somehow there's, it's a group of professionals 
who are successful and we're sharing how we succeeded and they're sharing technical information. I mean, we're talking about open source people, right? But it's a collection of professionals at a professional conference kind of thing. And a PHP conference can easily cost you 200 or 300 or, you know, 1,000 euros for a ticket for a weekend. So there's a different vibe going on there. Um, and I think, I guess we're doing, you know, I guess we're doing something really, really right in Drupal because we generally have larger events and, uh, you know, have a larger community. But it's a pretty fascinating contrast. And as I think as we go forward and learn from these communities, um, I, I don't know, I, I, think it's, I think it's just something to keep in mind. So, one year and, what's the date today? What's the date? Okay, so one year and 21 days ago, my face was completely naked. And um, I decided that I was going to grow the most ridiculous mustache that I possibly could. And um, who thinks I succeeded? <laughs> I couldn't bear to shave it off again this year. So I didn't, but uh, nonetheless, there's this Movember thing going on. I'm on the US Mo Drupal team. There's also a team here. Uh, um, there are cards going around for uh, European Drupal Movember team. Please donate to that, um, you know, to mine, of course. But uh, uh, no, because man, my CEO at our company, he, so uh, he was the largest single collector of donations in the entire campaign last year. And so, you know, it's a big deal at work. Anyway, listen, uh, uh, testicular cancer, prostate cancer, they're real problems that need more research and funding. All the money goes to that. Um, I have a uh, family who's in the middle of this right now and it's very unpleasant and I would really appreciate some help with that. And thanks again for the invitation for talking here. I hope it was reasonably coherent. <laughs>
there is a flyer for tonight's party. So there will be an official Drupal camp party organized by also a, a very dedicated Drupal Austria team member. Um, she brought some DJs there and there will also be visual artists scanning your data and visualizing your faces and I don't know what else would happen. Um, I think this will be fun and thanks to the sponsorship of Knagro, um on your party ticket there's also a drink coupon. Yo, check it out. Now I'm handing over again to Jam because they're gonna have to bring us to the group photo outside. So there's one more stupid Drupal event tradition. I need everybody to gather up your stuff go down the stairs in front of the main entrance where Schnitzel and I will be happy to immortalize you for the NSA. 